So in this section, we're going to start to develop an initial approach to therapy. Um, when I go through a therapeutic approach, I always want to know what the symptoms are, of course, uh, what the comorbid conditions are. The status of the patient's functionality is critical. Um, I think from my point of view, and, and I think the patient's point of view as well, is if we go forward in terms of function, if they can keep their job, if they can decrease their um, absenteeism, et cetera, those are very important parameters for, um, go as goals for our patient. It's important to the patient, their family life, their work function? Absolutely. And um, one of the things that I think is very important, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, is that uh, I always want to gauge the patient's ability to actually become compliant with what, I'm, what we're suggesting. How willing are they to take part of the load and be responsible for their care? And I think that's critical in, in assessing early on. Motivation varies. Sure does. Um, so let's go to our patient again. She's a 40-year-old female. I heard everywhere. I mean, we've heard that, that actual yeah, complaint. Very and common. It's one of those complaints that I almost want to walk back out the room when they <laughs> say that. Um, Is but it she, so vague? It's yeah. very vague, and, and you can't hurt everywhere. I mean, my forehead doesn't hurt, but uh, everywhere else does. So there's a six-month history of fatigue and non-restful sleep. She has difficulty at work and caring for her children. She complains about pain in her neck and her shoulders. She's tired and achy in her legs as well as her arms. She's 30 pounds overweight because she can't exercise because she is so achy. She has no exercise routine in place. She's tried the over-the-counter medications and some of the um, herbal medications. And as a result of all of this, her marriage is uh, becoming distressed. And I think I see that commonly uh, mm -hmm. in many of my patients. Yes, stress becomes amplified by stress. Exactly. So what I do in my initial approach, again, is really to use a visual analog scale called the m -Vasfic. And it, if you want to put this, in, I think for those people listening, one of the things that we'd like to use is fibro, F-I-B-R-O. And fibro stands for fatigue, for F, I for insomnia, B for blues, which includes both depression and anxiety, and also R for um, uh, stiffness, rigidity, and O for ow or pain. Mm -hmm. We use scales 1 through 10 or 1 through 100 depending on whether you're using centimeters or millimeters to have, actually have them mark uh, where they are in that particular last week or last day so that we have some kind of parameter that makes a sense so that when we do the follow-up we can actually say well you were here then if you recall this is your visual analog scale for these five different parameters and we can make that kind of comparison so we have at least a starting point from which we can compare when we go to the next follow-up. And severity matters, you know, because it, it's not constant. It's an up-down thing, but it's important to know where you're starting out from. Fibromyalgia can wax and wane, but can also not wax and wane. It can stay mild for a long time, moderate for a long time, or severe and intractable in, in a, a decent percentage of the cases. So um, in terms of therapy, the three FDA-approved medications are where we usually start. Um, not always, but usually. Uh, it depends on the patient, again. But we now have three that are now FDA-approved, and we have duloxetine, milnasopram, and pregabalin. One of the things that um, I think is very critical with any fibromyalgia patient is to start very low and go very slow. Oh, yes. They, they tend to be a group of people that are... Don't tolerate medicines very well. You've got to go low, start slow. And following along that line, in any time I give a, a medication, I want to be clear about what the positive effects and what the side effects are. And I'm very, um, uh, I exaggerate the side effects to some extent in the sense that I want to make sure I pass through all of those so that the patient isn't surprised that they might develop one of those. Right, and then that doesn't become their focus. You know, a little bit of warning is important. Um, in the 2005 uh, APS guidelines, there's some other drugs which are, don't have um, actual indications by the FDA, but I use frequently, and I've used them quite successfully. Yeah. Uh, we use tricyclic antidepressants in particular, amitriptyline. Again, very, very low doses. Sometimes I'll even start with a half of a 10-milligram pill. Absolutely. Um, and then work up from there and give them specifics about the uh, anticholinergic side effects, including dry eye, dry mouth, blurriness of vision, 
uh, and urinary retention. In our men, we want to be careful with patients with BPH because of that urinary retention. I also use cyclobenzaprine, which is a similar chemical, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which, uh, which I use actually in the 5 or 10 milligram dose and even can move up to 20 milligrams. And I find that also to be quite effective, uh, particularly for patients with insomnia, uh, when they have significant insomnia, both of these drugs can work quite well. These drugs are very useful in mild fibromyalgia. I don't find that they do enough in persons who have really moved into chronic severe, chronic moderate, but in mild early onset, these are great. These are my go-to as well. Um, other drugs that are in uh, first-line treatments are venlaxifene, which is um, used sometimes as an SNRI or is an SNRI that's mm-hmm. used. Uh, I use these three, amitriptyline, cyclobenzaprine, and venlaxifene, for patients who don't have great drug therapy coverage in their insurance because they're all generic and extremely inexpensive Very relative. Inexpensive, yeah. right. um, in the same light, I sometimes will use SSRIs such as, such as uh, fluoxetine, uh, which can be worked in combination with a tricyclic antidepressant such as amitriptyline in combination, the fluoxetine during the day, the amitriptyline an hour before sleep, and sometimes that can be a quite helpful combination for uh, patients who need uh, a a mood uh, enhancer such as fluoxetine and also have difficulty with good restful sleep. Hypnotics um, in patients with sleep disorders, which are common in fibromyalgia, I try to stay away from. The common ones that have been used uh, for non-fibromyalgia patients, I don't use. The benzodiazepines, I stay away from. I think there's significant components of uh, uh, a potential addiction with those, and so I don't use them. What I use mostly is exercise. I think if we can get patients to exercise, they're going to be much uh, more capable of sleeping. Um, There are two that are um, non-benzodiazepine that we use on occasion. Uh, Rameltion is one, and the other one is is Izeplicone. I try and, again, stay away from those. They're very short-acting. There are some other medications, I think, that work for uh, sleep much better. The armamentarium for sleep is pretty enriched these days, so I think it gives us a chance to sort of go, go through it. And some people respond better to one set than the other, and often people will come in having failed the hypnotics. I mean, they've tried them, and, you know, it doesn't do it for them because right. it's really their pain that's keeping them awake. Right. Um, the other modality we use on occasion, I, I've, gone, I've kind of swung from one direction to the other. That is injection of tender points. Um, I've kind of done my own uh, survey with their lidocaine or uh, some type of an anesthetic with a little bit, a little tiny bit of steroid. In my hands, if we can use a little bit of steroid, I think we get a longer uh, reaction in terms of benefit when we actually inject a trigger point. And I don't know how you feel about this, but I've um, used those in very severe patients who have significant muscle spasm and when you press on their trigger point, you actually get this kind of radiational type of uh, response from the patient. You center on the trigger point, mm-hmm. and you get this kind of radiation. And it's palpably uh, almost like a small pebble or a small rock underneath the skin. I really make a distinction between tender points and trigger points. And that doesn't mean that a very bad tender point can't be a trigger point. But I do make a distinction, you know, that a tender point is not necessarily a trigger point and a trigger point is not necessarily a tender point. And trigger points, you know, myofascial areas that you can have that sort of a, a, a almost referring pain from, I think that they respond very well to just the kind of injections that you're talking about. But tender points, not so much. I wouldn't approach them with a needle very often. So. Um, When we talk about sleep, um, the goal uh, for all patients with fibromyalgia is to get restful sleep, and that can be a real challenge. Yeah, these people have restless sleep. And uh, not only that, but they don't, the the quality of their sleep, they can't get to sleep, and then they can't stay asleep, Mm -hmm. and they rarely get into REM sleep and even the deeper phases of phase three and phase four sleep. They don't feel refreshed when they get up in the morning, so you know that their sleep architecture is disrupted. Um, I start off with uh, sleep hygiene, um, and I think sleep hygiene is interesting. It's uh, something that uh, most people don't think about. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the things we think about is uh, certainly avoiding caffeinated beverages towards uh, bedtime. We like to have um, the shades pulled and the room dark. I think light sensitivity is extremely important. 
Um, in addition, we want a comfortable pillow, we want a comfortable mattress, and consider actually switching that if something isn't quite right in that area. No watching TV in bed. Yeah, so the electronics have to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a big one because I know for me, I associate it sometimes going to bed with doing more work on my computer or my wife watching TV to try and get tired. So I think if we can get all the electronical electronic um, gizmos out of, the, out of the bedroom, that's good. So we can associate the bedroom with a quiet, dark, comfortable mattress, comfortable pillow area that's used at least behaviorally for sleep, and that's the way to go when it comes to sleep hygiene. Kind of a cave. Yeah. Um, exercise, absolutely critical. I just read an interesting review. The Cochrane uh, uh, review had um, exercise review of aerobic, moderate aerobic activity, and also strength training. Now, it was interesting, both of those two modalities actually improved a sense of well-being for patients with fibromyalgia. They didn't make a huge difference in the trigger points, except it was interesting that the uh, strength training actually did reduce trigger points in some patients. Not only well-being, but also depressive scores improved as well. So these are 12-week studies. And the, uh, the, uh, the conclusion was that more has to be done for a longer period of time. And what was not reviewed was stretching, such as yoga and other flexibility types of exercises, and swimming. Now, I don't know about you, but I think about swimming uh, as being probably the premier exercise. If we can get a patient to do it, and that's a big if, uh, to go swimming on a regular basis, 30 minutes, three times a week, for example. Well, it's not weight-bearing, so it's less painful. Getting people through the first initial pain of exercise is, is very, very hard. I mean, movement will cause some discomfort. I mean, it just will. Even the most conditioned athlete, you know, feels a little discomfort when they pump up their regimen. So I like to refer patients to physical therapists mm -hmm. who really are skilled with um, folks with fibromyalgia. I don't mean like the post-orthopedic surgery guys who are right. really only focused on improving function and getting that person back at work, getting them back in the game, but I mean physical therapy groups that really have a couple of therapists that understand fibromyalgia and the, again, go low, go slow. Right. Build it up, you know, build it up, have it not be too uh, high impact. One of the uh, components I think that PAs and nurse practitioners can do in this area, and I mentioned this earlier um, to somebody else I was speaking to about this, is to actually go and make an inventory of those practitioners in your community that are, uh, are really um, sensitive to fibromyalgia you patients. physical therapists? Physical you therapists, yeah. uh -huh. acupuncturists, um, and moving on even into the, into the uh, psychotherapists and psychiatrists uh, in the community. And I think if, if one takes the time, which I think few of us have the time to do that, but if you make that effort, and compile that list it can be very beneficial for the patient and I think it's a great asset and shows the patient that you really do care about what it is that they're they're going to, who they're going to see and what they're going to, what to expect and because because just as not all physical therapists have an interest in fibromyalgia very often psychotherapists are exactly. more interested in um, you know, kind of working in whether family dynamics or right. sort of childhood abuse issues, and I'm not saying those aren't important. They are very important to resolve. But cognitive behavioral therapy usually is short term and helps people sort of refocus on how they're thinking about their current state of health. And I think rethinking how they're experiencing pain and dysfunction is very important for people to be willing to feel more motivated, to feel they can move ahead in their life and they're not sort of stuck in this pain syndrome. Right. One of the, one of the points about uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that I didn't know uh, well is that they actually um, focus on negative thought patterns and how to change that, mm -hmm. negative behavioral patterns and how to change that, uh, setting limits, um, having rest periods, uh, finding activities that you enjoy uh, so that you're likely to go back to them over and over again, and uh, taking rest. I think rest is an important part of that, and uh, all of these things can be very beneficial. And it's been shown that the depressive component of those patients who have a major uh, component of depression and fibromyalgia do better with cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, that brings us to mental health, and of course, um, 
If there's a comorbid uh, depression, what I like to use, if there's a significant depressive component, I will use uh, duloxetine to start again low, increasing the dose. Um, and if the patient has more fibro fog and a little bit of needs activation mm -hmm. because they're so fatigued, I'll use minalsopran. Mm -hmm. If they have significant insomnia, sometimes um, pregabalin can be helpful, a dose at bedtime only. It, it's also very helpful with pain. People who have painful sleep seem to do well with pregabalin on board. Um, one of the things that um, I, I also like to ask them to try and do is to reduce their stress. Now, that's easy enough to be said. Please reduce your stress. All of us have it. None of us can do it. Right. Um, but I think scheduling activities throughout the day or during parts of the week, uh, pacing uh, their activities so that they don't feel like they have to get the whole uh, you know, house cleaned in one day, but maybe pick a room, uh, and actually learn, teaching them how to relax. I think those are all very important. And one of the things that, in my community, at least in Danbury, we have a, a wonderful set of mental health practitioners who are therapists, counselors, and psychiatrists who actually like patients who have fibromyalgia and are very well versed in it. And I think those kinds of activities are well worth the effort, and, and it's nice to have uh, somebody else actually take that component on in our community. Yeah. So uh, that um, actually kind of takes care of the initial therapy, and that's how I approach it. Yeah. Um, so in our next section, we'll talk about the first follow-up visit. Uh -huh.